Last month, I picked up the M3 MacBook Air to review and used it as my daily machine for over two weeks. This video is the exact process I followed to get up and running as quick as possible, having all of the essential settings and apps to use it productively. With every Mac I get, I do like to start from a clean slate, but whether you've just got a new machine or have been using your Mac for a little while, I promise you'll learn something new. First, let's talk about the essential settings you'll want to enable, as well as some tips to keep your Mac as minimal and easy to use as possible. Starting with appearance, I like to enable dark mode and the graphite accent color. I then like to pair this with a clean wallpaper like one from the prism pack, link in description. Before moving forward, I disable most notifications, importantly from my email. At least in my experience, nothing is ever that urgent, so waiting until I truly have time to check my inbox not only frees up stress, but saves time in my day. Apple Mail is fine, but I personally use Spark. More on that later. Now, in accessibility settings, enabling three-finger drag is a must. This makes moving around Windows on screen much easier. I'll talk about my recommended apps in a minute, but Rectangle is one that's absolutely essential to have right now, as it gives you the same window snapping features as found on Windows. I highly recommend taking the time to learn the shortcuts though, because it makes managing Windows so quick and easy. If you have multiple apps open on screen and want to move one without disturbing the current hierarchy, simply command click to drag it. Now, the dock is something I try to keep as clean as I can, so I remove everything but the apps I use the most. Everything else can easily be found using Raycast, more on that in a bit. For the few apps I keep here especially, I like to change their icons to have a consistent theme. You can do this with an app like IconChamp, or simply command click an app to reveal it in Finder, and then press command I to pull up more info. In here, you just need to drop an icon file on it and then restart the dock. If you want to do this, I definitely recommend checking out macOSicons.com as they have a ton of free icons that you can download. To help keep the dock clean, I disable show recent apps and remove the download folder as there's a much better way to have easy access to it, more on that in the app section. Within the dock settings, you can change the behavior for when you double click the title bar of an app, but I like to have this as a quick way to minimize it. The desktop can also get cluttered quite easy, so I try to stay in the habit of deleting any temporary files immediately, as well as clearing the trash can. But so that I never have to see any of the lingering ones, I hide all items on the desktop. Now, the last category of settings we'll want to change has to do with Finder. This is because before you go and download anything, you'll want this to be organized. First, I like to remove almost everything from the toolbar. Instead of the share icon, I replace it with AirDrop, and I remove the view button, as using the command 1-4 through four shortcuts is much quicker. It can be easy to get lost within Finder, and so remembering the option command P shortcut means you can quickly pull up the current file path. I like to keep this off by default to keep things clean, and only have it when I need it. If you ever have a file that's automatically automatically opening in the wrong app, you can press command I to quickly open up more info and then select which app you want it to open in. To keep files tidy, when in the icon view, I highly recommend sorting files by snap to grid so that you don't need to manually right click and clean up the files. Lastly, keeping the sidebar clean has been one of the best decisions I've made when it comes to keeping files organized. I'll occasionally keep a few folders that I need quick access to like for YouTube, development, or wallpapers as I like to change those out pretty often. Now that we've covered the most important important settings, there's a few shortcuts and general tips that I think are worth knowing if you want to use macOS most effectively for work. It takes time to learn shortcuts, but once you know them, it can save you infinitely more time than going through an interface. If you frequently copy a file to paste somewhere else, but then have to go back and delete the original, simply hitting Command C and then Command Option V pastes and destroys the original so you don't have to. Instead of right clicking to rename a file, once you have it selected, you can just hit return. Also, if you have multiple files that you need to rename in a similar fashion, you don't need to manually rename each one. With all of them selected, if you right click to rename it, it brings up a pop-up menu where you can quickly replace text, add text before or after, or completely change the format. If you have lots of apps open on your screen, you can quickly quit one of them by hitting Command Q or minimize using Command H. Additionally, using Command Backtick, you can quickly switch between different instances of an app. I find this most useful when working in Notion, when I have my script open in one window and my shot list in another. Now, lastly, a trick that I found a few weeks ago that's an absolute game changer for me is option clicking the sound icon in the menu bar reveals additional settings to configure your input. For apps, one that I mentioned earlier was Raycast, and for the most part, I use this because I think it's a nicer version of Spotlight Search. There's also some built-in features like currency and time zone conversions, along with basic calculations that are great to have. There's a bunch of integrations and just countless things that you can do with it that I don't even take advantage of. Another app worth mentioning is Setup 
app, which is actually an app that gives you access to more apps. I did get a free license from them, but they're not sponsoring the video, and I think it can be worth paying $10 a month for if there's enough apps on here that you find useful. Some are low quality, honestly, but there's some hidden gems in here that have made my life a lot easier. The first being Drop Zone, which hides in your menu bar until you need it, and there's so many things that it can do. My favorite is being able to drop a DMG file for an app within it, have the installer ran, and then the original file deleted. There's a lot more added actions you can download, but the other one I've been getting a ton of use out of is the Change Desktop Wallpaper. Rather than going into settings and importing a wallpaper file, you can just drop one and have it instantly update. And lastly, what I was talking about earlier was that you have quick access to the downloads folder. Another app from Setup is Tech Sniper. This lets you instantly copy text on screens so that if you're watching a video, you don't have to manually type it out. For taking screenshots, my favorite app is CleanShot. I think standalone, it's a little expensive for what it is, but being in Setup is nice as I love using it to take screenshots of individual windows with a nice wallpaper background effect. You can also easily hide sensitive info and mark it up. For screen recordings, I personally use Screen Studio, which is a paid app costing $90, but if you do a lot of screen recordings or tutorials, this is great. I love it because like CleanShot, you can overlay a tab on your wallpaper for a clean effect, but it can also auto zoom on your cursor to create more engaging videos. It has an entire built-in editor that's pretty good and lets you make some great videos really quickly. For managing passwords, I use 1Password, mainly because it's cross-platform, and it's the one that I've used for over two years now. It's great, of course, to store passwords, but it's also nice to keep credit card info. For my calendar, I use Ami, mainly because I love the design, but it also has a built-in to-do list and email client that's super interesting. To access the email and add more than, I think, three external calendars, you have to pay like 15 bucks a month, which is a lot for a calendar, and it's still really buggy. For email, I use Spark, and I just found out a couple of weeks ago that the paid version was in setup. This gives you some extra AI features that can be useful at times, but simply having the home screen has been great. I don't know why they lock this behind a paywall, but instead of heading straight into your inbox, when you open the app, it puts you on this hello screen that lets you view just your new emails if you want. I have found this saves me time when I'm just habitually opening my email for no real reason. Speaking of saving time though, I just this week started using Rise, which is a time tracker app that's been really useful for me. You can set up focus work blocks for however long you'd like, but I found it most helpful during 25 to 45 minute sessions. Doing this while sticking to a single task following my calendar has kept me far more productive than trying to do it all on my own. It tells you the exact amount of time you spend in every app, which I found super interesting, and it's almost become a game for me to see how much time I can save using it. The last thing I'll say on it is it has pop-ups that if it catches you lacking, will not let you slide. For $16 a month, it's expensive, and you could honestly achieve similar results just setting a timer, but it's already saved me literal hours between editing and screen scripting this week that makes it worth it for me. It has a trial, so I recommend giving it a shot. Now, for my browser, I recently switched from Chrome to Arc, and I've been loving it. I initially tried it out for the sidebar, as you can hide it and have a really clean looking tab, but getting to use it, I find it a little quicker to use, having easy shortcuts for new tabs. It's also super easy to switch between different spaces for work, school, etc., and have different bookmarks and tabs for each. It still runs on Chromium under the hood, so all the same Chrome extensions are going to work. One of my most used recently has been YouTube speed controller. If I'm watching a tutorial, this makes it really quick to speed up the video and save some time. For the developers watching, I use VS Code for my personal web dev projects and any computer science assignments that I have. I mainly love the sheer amount of extensions that are available that make it really powerful to use. It has essentials like prettier for code formatting, auto renaming tags, but also language or tool specific extensions like React snippets or regex snippets. If you work on a team, GitLens is useful to see who made a change and when or even on a personal project if you do a lot of work on it, this is nice to have a good overview of your repo. Now, there's also the AI extension for GitHub Copilot, which can be helpful while coding, though it's definitely not perfect and you need to know how to code in order to use it effectively because it can just straight up lie. That said, it's been great to help with remembering syntax, making small tweaks, or generating fake data. In addition to extensions, there's a lot of themes that you customize the editor to your liking. Personally, I like the minimal theme from Nishabosh. Through school, I get all of the JetBrains IDEs for free, which is great as I use IntelliJ almost every day at work and the debugger is great. iTerm is my terminal of choice for no reason other than I think it looks better. You can change the color of the window and add a transparency effect that I like more than the stock terminal app. 
Now, for content creation, Notion is the obvious choice for organized thoughts, so I won't go too deep into it, but all of my videos are planned and scripted in here. Notion is overkill though for simple notes and quick thoughts, so I've been using Simple Note recently. This is basically just Apple Notes, but cross-platform, so that I can use it on my S24. I've yet to find a good cross-platform reminders app. Google Tasks just doesn't work that well, so if you have any recommendations, let me know. I edit all of my videos within DaVinci Resolve. After trying all of the main editors, this has been my favorite. I find the timeline really easy to work on and the color correction tools to be very powerful. I do have the entire Adobe suite, mainly because the student discount makes it a lot more affordable, and I use Audition to record voiceovers and Lightroom to edit thumbnails. I don't do too much design, but it's something I really enjoy, and when I do, I use Figma. It's of course an interface designing tool, but I found that it's good for a lot more than that, as you can create wallpapers or things like performance charts really easily. I get more use out of Framer though, which is a website builder with a nearly identical interface. Phase. This essentially lets you design and build at the same time, which saves a lot of time. This is a pretty powerful tool that I love using and is what I host my personal site on. It's aimed towards designers and definitely a bit pricey at $30 a month, but it's so easy to create CMS collections for custom dynamic pages that I think it's worth it. Give it a shot. So these have been the best apps and settings that I make sure to use whenever I set up a new MacBook. I hope you learned something useful today, and if you want to hear more about the M3 MacBook Air, Go watch my full video where I talk about what it's like to daily drive and why it may be a better option than the MacBook Pro. Take care.